So our final uh, speakers and guests of tonight uh, are the Center for Genomic Astronomy. As Anya said at the beginning, you can see the project they've made there, which is the Rare Endophyte Collectors Club. And uh, that's like a really good kind of amalgamation of the workshop and all of the results. So then uh, you can see everything that people made and uh, all the plant samples from Amsterdam Nord. Um, so the Center for Genomic Astronomy is an artist-led think tank uh, that examines biotechnologies and biodiversity of human food systems. Their work is often site-specific and it takes new forms in reaction to each environment. Um, for the exhibition, they created this rare endophyte collectors club and um, they're going to come up here and talk about their work and uh, also uh, do some live plating, which is gonna be really exciting. So uh, welcome, Connor first. No, Zach, welcome, Zach. <laughs> Do you want to use your computer? Yeah, no, I'm just looking notes on here. Ah, so, right. Uh, yes. Okay, so, uh, yeah, thanks. Um, so, let's see, I'm going to do two, two of these at once. Yes, I'm Zach. Some of you guys already saw this. We felt bad Connor didn't have a slide last week, so we, we thought we'd do it again. I like to talk to the public. This is Kat. She doesn't like to talk to the public, and she's like eight months pregnant, so she's not here. Um, but she's, uh, we met, and she was trying to make it snow ice cream and looking at geoengineering, and we both liked food and emerging technologies. And then Emma joined us, and uh, she was in the field searching for some kind of strange foods here. And Connor has a slide now. Where is he? Yes. Yeah, yeah. And uh, so Connor's a microbiologist uh, by training who joined us, uh, I don't know, eight months ago. And he's um, quite keen on talking to strange people like artists, designers, and poets about the rational and irrational world. Um, so yeah, so we're the Center for Genomic Astronomy. And we say that we examine the biotechnologies and biodiversity of human food systems. We've been doing this for seven years insanely. Um, and as you guys heard, there's no arts funding in the U.S., uh, so we had to write a mission statement so we could become a nonprofit. So our mission is to map food controversies, prototype alternative culinary futures, and imagine a more just, biodiverse, and beautiful food system. So I hope you felt like you were making a small dent in that when you joined the Endo Fight Club this week. And we collaborate with all kinds of folks, um, scientists, farmers, Chefs, hackers, uh, writers. These are some of the most recent collaborations. Um, this is us in our natural habitat, having fun in the kitchen, being ridiculous, and finding unusual things to do with food. So I just want to tell you quickly about our practice, and then I think I just picked three projects um, to give some context for how we came to Endo Fight Club. Um, so for the first seven years, we made a lot of publications because we like writing and making up new language for trying to explain things that we don't quite understand. Uh, in terms of hackers and designers, we were trying to connect hackers and foodies for a long time. And basically our friends who are chefs or in the food you know, activism movement didn't like that we were talking to computer hackers because they were evil and they wasted all their time in front of digital screens. And then we were going to all these hacker um, camps and uh, conferences and the food was really bad. And so we were like, okay, this is something's gotta, gotta happen here. So we wrote this publication, Food Freaking, um, try to come out with a new issue every year to imagine if these folks talk to each other, what would they talk about and what would it look like? So that's one of the publications uh, that we do, and that's how we try to make sense of uh, the intersection of those two communities. We do a lot of objects and exhibitions as well, um, and we, take, uh, we make recipes and meals. So that's a lot of our practices, working with chefs or making recipes ourselves. Uh, one of my favorite is vegan ortolan, where we took the cruelest dish ever made, a French dish where you... Uh, drown a bird in ammoniac after you force fed it for six months, and we gave it to a chef to make a vegan version down to the bones and the innards. Uh, she was really upset at first, and then she understood the sort of magic of this act. So we served that to lots of people, including Bruno Latour, which was really funny. Um, and then we do labs and workshops, like we did this week. So that's what we get up to. 
we make a lot of vehicles and that are at different scales. Some of them are on wheels and some of them are like boxes and they're for transmitting food and transmitting ideas. But we don't really have a home and we don't have like a gallery or money, so we forgot where we stored all these. So the first thing we did this year was make a drawing to figure out what we had made and where they were. We recovered most of them, but I have no idea where the planetary sculpture table is. It's like in a castle in Lisbon somewhere. So if you see a big, shiny, six-sided table, it's ours, and let us know. We'll go pick it up. Um, so, you know, we really think that taste matters, and by that we mean both flavor and our sensual perception, um, but also preferences. And so um, the first few years, we basically just asked the same stupid question, which is what happens if I put this in my mouth, like a child does, and you learn a lot that way. Um, so that's one method for critical inquiries, to ask stupid questions. Um, so we kind of started our research in 2010 in, in Bangalore, India, or Bengaluru, and this was the time when, um, this, has anyone heard of the company Monsanto? I guess Bear owns them now or something. So Monsanto's subsidiary Mahiko was trying to introduce a genetically modified aubergine in India, and that was a bit surprising because uh, it's indigenous to South Asia and has lots of diversity, and there's lots of resistance to this. So this is an image from, um, uh, that my students took uh, about a protest in front of the environmental minister's visit to Bangalore. And so one of the things we found really fascinating is that the, one of the protesting groups was using the appeal of um, agricultural biodiversity and saying, look at all this amazing biodiversity you have within our farm system. Why do we want this GMO? It's not, it's not what we want. Um, however, no one was sort of talking about what this brinjal, this uh, genetically modified aubergine would taste like, BT brinjal. And so we started asking that question. We were looking at a lot of the press in um, Hindi and English and Canada. And once you start asking what GMOs taste like, you uncover all kinds of strange things. So we were coll collecting the um, sort of biodiversity uh, of Brinjal in southern India, finding out the local names Ca in Canada, the English names. And we had a massive cook-off in the middle of the street and invited people to come share all their recipes. Uh, developing ideas around culinary preservation and connecting sort of rural and urban populations around these uh, memories of food and maintaining uh, both the biodiversity of the fields and the biodiversity of the kitchen. That all sounds really serious, and it was. So now for some ridiculous stuff, because we have to have fun. Um, and we just ask, what happens if I put this in my mouth? So we ate the only genetically modified animal you can buy in the U.S. We made glowing sushi cooking show. We still get occasional death threats on YouTube, so watch the video, but we'd prefer less death threats. Uh, we made cobalt 60 sauce, a barbecue sauce from radiation bred plants, and we imagined if we are going to de-extinct animals and bring them back from extinction, we'll probably eat them to death like we did the first time around, so we'll need the deli to do that. Um, so yeah, we, we kind of have a sick sense of humor sometimes. Okay, so a couple of definitions, a couple of projects, and then Endo Fight Club. Um, why genomic astronomy? So genomics enables scientists to study genetic variability and interactions between all of an organism's genes and the environment. So we wanted to look at biology and genetics and ecology, but from as wide a perspective as possible, not a reductive way. And gastronomy is the art of choosing, cooking, and eating good food. So genomic gastronomy is the study of the organisms and environments manipulated by human food cultures. So if you look behind us, we have a little sign we made, we have always been biohackers. And by that, we mean there's nothing uh, naturally occurring or wild about all of these uh, plants you see in front of us. In fact, this was shot like three blocks from here in Amsterdam. Uh, we just bought a bunch of food at the market. And so all of the variation in color and texture and size you see have come from selections that some humans have made. So by always, I guess we mean about 10,000 years, or the dawn of agriculture. So who's heard of molecular gastronomy? Not that many people? OK, a few people. So um, initially, we were kind of making fun of molecular gastronomy. Uh, but now they're OK. Uh, so they apply a lot of kitchen chemistry and look at sort of uh, chemistry and physics uh, and, and apply a scientific methodology to the cuisine, but it's also it's often about reducing food to its bare essentials, breaking it down, and then building it back up. 
And I think we were much more interested in the sort of uh, more connective or holistic approach to food, looking at the biological and ecological research. Um, and, and imagining ways we might reinvent our, our human food system. And so we kind of did this, I guess you could say in a, a satirical way, but the, as I mentioned, the danger of satire is you often become the thing you're making fun of. So now we're like this center with people all over the world and getting calls from people who aren't artists and doing this in like a really genuinely serious way, which is kind of unnerving. So we've recently been contacted by the Culinary Breeding Network, which is this group of um, public plant breeders who works with chefs to make new varieties and revive old varieties. So these guys are definitely doing genomic gastronomy in like a really applied way. We just, we just play it on TV. But they seem to like what we're up to, so that's interesting. Okay, uh, so hackers and designers, part of the food thing is recombinatorial cuisine. Um, folks maybe have heard of Chef Watson, sort of this IBM project right, of using uh, art uh, artificial intelligence or evolutionary algorithms to make uh, recipes. So that's definitely a place we started a long time ago. Um, five years ago, we made the Spice Mix supercomputer, hoping to blend every uh, possible spice combination on the planet. Spices are one of these uh, foodstuffs that have always circulated around the globe, way before the sort of contemporary globalization. Uh, and so, yeah, we made this machine to make all the combinations possible. Uh, the first one was a bit rough and ready. Uh, it worked, but we had an olfactory synthesizer based on a patch bay synthesizer system. But instead of making sounds, you would patch in different smells. So you put your head in this helmet and you can combine different smells. And if you like them, you could um, get them printed out in a sort of two and a half D print of blended spices. Uh, I was also really proud because um, we made someone puke with this project, so it's always nice. To be fair, they were, they were pretty uh, toasted, um, and then they, they got mad, but if you, if you smell a lot of spices, it can make you nauseous. Um, we got more sophisticated recently, and so it's a five by five array of um, computer fans that Emma and Kat stayed up all night uh, soldering. Sounded pretty pressure. And behind each uh, fan is uh, s some spices that you then press the button and smell. And of course, we have the iPad uh, menu to make it all very easy and efficient. Uh, yeah, so this was like the automated version where you get your spice mix printed. And so I think we got pretty interested in this idea of all the, going through all the possible permutations of a, of a database. And so more recently, we've taken this to the concept of bioregionalism uh, with Loki Food Lab. So a lot of our projects start off kind of handmade and janky, and then someone finally gives us enough money to make them like big. So this is me and Emma standing on the street in Portland, Oregon with our, with our box. Um, You'll see it grows. So um, we're trying to help people imagine bioregional food futures. And by that, we mean not romanticizing like, oh, local hand-grown basil leaf, but actually integrating the entire regional system back into um, what we eat and what we grow and how we take care of that. Uh, so part of that is having a conversation about the attributes we want in a food system. So in the early versions, again, it's a punch card. And, and of course, we get the iPad later on. And based on... Um, your selections of the attributes you want in a food system, we give you a personalized taster. And it kind of kicks off a really interesting conversation about what people want out of their food system. So we've done this in Cascadia, which is a sort of alternative name for the Pacific Northwest in the US, uh, as well as the Celtic broadleaf bioregion, which is in Dublin, Ireland, actually most of Ireland and into parts of uh, Scotland and Wales. Yeah, so this, it got big, right? It was a box and now it's like this crazy cart. So we've kind of taken this around the world. And we do some real-time data visualization so people can kind of see what everyone else is selecting. So um, just the, in terms of the term bioregion, uh, you know, it's synonymous with ecoregion, but it's basically this concept that perhaps um, the way we organize our political boundaries should be based more on ecology rather than other aspects, um, and it has stewardship as its primary goal with the belief um, that the, the political boundaries should match the ecological and cultural boundaries. So this is the United States redrawn um, with bioregions. So yeah, we can use computers and databases to get inspiration. Here's an example of two of the different dishes that people got uh, from Cascadia based on what their uh, pr preferences were. So on one side, we have convenient, profitable, and protein-rich. And on the other side, someone wanted delicious, open source, and traditional. 
Uh, and in Dublin, affordable, nutritious, and protein-rich, uh, and biodiverse, biodiverse, delicious, and local. And that clear thing is baby formula. It's like a brittle made out of baby formula because that's surprisingly the biggest export from Ireland. They send like all of their baby formula from milk to East Asia. So we had to include it. We originally made baby formula marshmallows and they were disgusting. So we said no. Okay. So in terms of taste, um, you know, we've played a lot with looking at specific species and organisms and then recombining them in new ways with computers. And now we're really interested in looking at how our environment tastes and what we taste like. We can only show you one of these two things because there's not a lot of time. So come talk to us about the weird thing over there. Connor can tell you about it. But in terms of what our environment tastes like, um, you know, we've been looking at this sort of smog tasting thing uh, for a few years now. It started in 2012 in Bangalore. Uh, India, we were working with students on a food and politics class, and we read this quote from um, Harold McGee's on food and cooking. Uh, Thanks to eggs, we are able to harvest the air. At the stiff peak stage, egg foam is approaching 90% air. And we realized that when we could whip egg whites and sugar together, we could collect the air pollution. So we went, went around the city and collected air pollution from different sites, put them on a map and fed them to people. And surprise, surprise, nobody wanted to eat the Makery Circle one which is a really polluted neighborhood in Bangalore. And so we started doing these urban taste tests in different cities. And other, it's an open source project, and the people asked if they could build on it. Um, so this was a journalist um, from South America uh, that did this smog tasting with her friends. But eventually, um, oh, and most recently, we did it in New Delhi with some art and design students. But the limitation of this is you can only taste the pollution from where you're from, and you know, occasionally you want to taste pollution from different places, so you can compare across it. So working with Nicola Twilley, who's a writer and researcher, uh, we went down to UC Riverside, University of California. Um, this is their smog synthesizer chamber. They pump in different chemicals to like synthesize different smogs. And this is why sometimes scientists are awesome. Like they're just surprised that anyone wants to talk to them, that anyone cares, and they're like, yeah, here's how we pump in our chemicals. Here's a recipe and a chart. You should go make your own thing. So we did. And they gave us like all the really nasty chemicals to put in there to make like Atlanta smog, Beijing smog, New Delhi smog, Los Angeles smog. Finally, we got smart. And when we were doing this, we put on a gas mask because uh, our throats were really hurting. Um, so this, and, and what's kind of interesting is we can not only compare across geographies, but also time. So we were able to make like 19th century smog from like London pea super time. And you know, part of this practice is to treat these things as ingredients rather than chemicals because we put them in our body, but not by choice. And then giving people the choice makes them understand what they're putting in their body that they don't want to, perhaps. Also, the soot was, uh, in this case, gathered from the BQE in Brooklyn, which is amazing. Hand-gathered, very, very nice. Um, so we've kind of done this all over, everything from like on the street in New York to um, all of the health ministers of the world, the World Health Organization. So that was kind of a trip that we were feeding smog to like all the health ministers. One guy came into the room and didn't read the signage, ate it, and it was the minister from Australia. Uh, and just so you know, that's what smog looks like. So this is like totally serious. We're taking the precursor chemicals for smog and breaking them down under UV light. And I think for a lot of our practice, we want things to be quite materially um, honest and real. And so this um, woman in San Francisco came up and said, uh, I ate your smog and my throat hurts. And we're like, yes, it's smog. And she goes, oh, I thought you were abstract artist. <laughs> we said, no, we're realists. And she goes, oh. And, but that's like, like really actually quite important to us. Like you really saw something happen that was amazing. Um, and you know, part of this research, we're connecting with um, a researcher in Mexico City and she's one of the only people we found who's studying the effects of air pollution on, on sensory mechanisms. And so part of her hypothesis is that street food has to be so pungent, so spicy and so sour because you have such decreased taste um, experiences in conditions of uh, you know, bad, poor air quality. So for this one, we did um, a smog pairing where you could get like a Mexican uh, city style street taco with Mexico City smog, which was, Okay, so yeah, how does our environment taste and what do we taste like? Uh, into the rare endophyte collectors club. So this is the last thing we'll say. Um, I think we're really interested in uh, making biology open and accessible and biotechnology 
um, to have much more ambitious and beautiful dreams than it has. And so the Rare End of Fight Collectors Club is our first attempt at that. We've um, conducted it in um, Ireland, California, India, Spain, uh, Netherlands, and a few other places. But basically, um, we're trying to imagine what biotechnology looks like when it's not um, profit maximizing, uh, and when it is about um, community and uh, being social, and also um, being embodied in the landscape. So we collect plants from the landscape and we grow out the small microorganisms that live inside those plants. And um, just like our own bodies have a microbiome, things that live on our skin and inside of our guts, so too do plants. So this is a small snapshot of the plant microbiome. And then we try to um, see these plants as being quite different as, and being not singular organisms, but being much more complex. And then we end up seeing ourselves in that way as well, we think. Uh, so yeah, I invite you to go take a look at the uh, Endo Fight Club of Amsterdam's uh, installation in the back. And thank you very much, uh, participants, for helping us put that together. And thanks for listening to us about the Center for Genomic Gastronomy. And now uh, two of my colleagues will come up and tell you more about endophytes. I can say your names, but yeah, Connor and Emma. Yeah, where we go? I should have given you more warning. No, no, it's good. All right. Is the camera going on this one or this one? Uh, that, that one's just mine for notes. Well, let's totally do a question while these guys are setting up. It'll just be a minute, but yeah, yeah. So are there any questions? I'll do, my, do our own Q&A. Yep. Uh, a bit of an uh, sorry, a bit of an odd question, but um, have you ever toyed with the idea of a uh, taste of human? Taste of yeah, <laughs> it's as if he was planted. Yeah. So the project we didn't talk about uh, was to flavor our tears. This was the strain image with uh, Connor, and uh, we're kind of doing these pop-up restaurants where the human body is what's being flavored. And this is not about like cannibalism; it's about the microorganisms and insects that consume our body. And we spend so much time trying to make our food taste good, like why wouldn't we want it ourselves to taste good for the things that eat us? So we've kind of like done things where we scrape off people's skin cells and look at them under a microscope and let them know about what's eating them at that moment. Uh, we do this sort of virtual reality experience um, where these moths from Thailand drink the tears of mammals. Uh, and so we've kind of created our own virtual reality system to like uh, do that. And then we've been collecting people's tears. Um, so, uh, to feed these moths. So yeah, yeah, we're all about uh, humans being eaten. <laughs> Any other questions? Maybe you guys are ready? All right. You guys have been very impressive. It's like, got dark in here, didn't know how long it's gonna happen. No, I think one's good. Yeah. Can is, is that working? Hello. Yeah. Okay, great. Um, right, so I'm just going to do like a super quick um, sample plating. Um, this is what we were doing with the guys. Um, during the week where we w went out into the field, selected our plants, and uh, thought about what types of endophytes they might like to find. Um, so the, the, one of the key things that you need to be able to do in order to uh, work with microbes or work with, um, on, on, with any kind of like molecular biology is to be able to create a microenvironment um, that will support the life that you want to uh, see. Um, and also just in encourage it in a way that will allow you to separate it out from every other microbe that's in the same system as it. So, um, 
Can you see things? Yeah, I think so. It's so uh, slow to the to the. Uh... Oh wow. Okay. There's a little bit of a lag on it. Yeah, but it's okay. It looks amazing over here. I'm getting a great presentation. <laughs> uh, okay, so. Um, so earlier on, I picked out some um, strawberry leaves, um, amongst other um, agriculturally important um, plants that were all just like growing out in the bays out there. So uh, the thing with the endophytes is that they're found in every single um, uh, tissue of the plant. Um, so you want to pick out different types of tissues in order to uh, harvest endophytes that would be associated uh, with those points. So the thing that's actually, the, thing, the reason why we're interested in endophytes is because they're able to give a benefit or a bonus to a plant without us having to tinker with any kind of genetics. Okay, so it's like, it's like an, an old school version of genetic engineering, except that we never went through this part, we never went through this phase of trying to take microbes from one plant and transplant them into another. Um, in order to get that benefit or that bonus. So, um, doing okay? Yeah. Uh, so here we have a, a, a nice and clean uh, agar plate. It's uh, you know, nicely un uncontaminated, unlike these other ones that I have over here on the table, which if you want to come over, I'll tell you about. Um, and the thing, that's, uh, the thing that's important is to create a sterile or an aseptic environment. So we need to be able to use uh, our uh, bleaches and alcohols to uh, remove any kind of spores or any kind of um, microbes that we don't want. So this is the thing about endophytes and really the first rule of endophyte club should actually be they have to be endophytes, okay? Because we ended up getting obviously hackers, hackers don't follow rules and we had people plating out mushrooms and lichen and things like these, which I, I'm not going to um, lie, they are interesting to see them grow and see what they do, but it's an end of fight club, okay? <laughs> so, um, I'll, you know, I'll show you the mushrooms and stuff later on as well. They're cool. I'll be over in the corner like for questions as well. Um, so, first and foremost, we have our, let's say, our strawberry leaf. And um, what we want to do is we want to start to think about where these microbes are, what they're doing, you know, what their plan is, and like get into that kind of headspace, right? So whatever that's growing inside the strawberry leaves, let's say for example, the straw these 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 strawberry leaves were huge and like obviously great at like collecting sunlight for the plants. We um, uh, just wash them in this bleach uh, of the of the part that we want to take a, a clipping from, um, and then we just dry it off a little bit because when you have bleach on a plate, it can cause problems. Um, so we just use these little cotton pads to dry it off. And from there then, you sterilize your scissors using stronger bleach. So that one was just a, a diluted because you can see that it's white. And this one is undiluted because the scissors have like a harder job to do and getting through the tissue, so it gets all gunky. Um, so what we just do is select a, an area that we want to take a sample from. So what I normally do is cut across the vascularity on either, on either side of what the sample is going to be. Um, so, uh, tweezers. And the reason that we do this is so that we can actually open up the cellular structure um, and reveal it to the plate when we place it on it. So um, this is the thing, you know, they're, they are endophytes. They live intracellularly in the plant, which means that they're actually um, living you know, within the veins and within the, the tissue of the plant itself. And so if you just place the leaf onto the plate without any um, openings, they're not gonna be able to get out. Um, so we open it up. And uh, normally we, um, normally we do this with a flame, in order to make sure that the environment is aseptic, so that there's no spores or anything falling down on the plate. So I'm going to do a, a little a little cheat right now because we don't have a flame, where I turn the plate upside down, and plate 
upside down so that the spores don't fall onto the plate itself. Yeah, I've got an impression anyway. Yeah, okay, that's enough. Okay, great, perfect. So that's, uh, that's how you plate a plate. Um, it's super, super difficult. Um, but yeah, that's it. That's like basically your first step. And then you start to grow things, and then like it's a whole, it's a, it's a, it's a wild journey. Um, so thanks, thank you very much for your time, and um, I'll be over in the corner uh, if you want to have a chat with me about microbes. I think that was really great um, closure of this event. Um, yeah, please feel free to take some more drinks in the bar. There's one thing that this uh, in between area from here and the bar is not a terrace area. You can have drinks at the bar and on the other side outside. So it would be nice if uh, we avoid lingering here <laughs> in front. And the last call at the bar is 11.30 but you can hang out at the bar until 12, just so you guys have a sense of timing. Um, oh, we're, if anyone wants to come back, we're open tomorrow from 12 to 6, so the exhibition's open tomorrow and Sunday from 12 to 6, and on Sunday we have a really special uh, concert um, at 4 o'clock uh, from uh, DNK. I don't know if they're here. Anyways, it's going to be really great. A nice little finishage and uh, some DJing, so uh, come by tomorrow or come by on Sunday. Or tell your friends. Thank you for coming out. <laughs>